Hello. <laughs> uh, welcome and thank you for being here uh, for the 2023 Yates Lecture hosted by the Murphy Institute. Uh, I'm John Lewis Howard, Associate Director of the Murphy Institute, uh, and I have a couple of uh, announcements to make before we get started. I will remind you at this point, please silence your cell phones. So thank you for that. I'd like to read a land acknowledgement. Uh, at the beginning of every public lecture at Tulane, we have a land acknowledgement to pay tribute to people who came before us and occupied these places. Uh, we acknowledge and pay tribute to the original inhabitants of this land. The city of New Orleans is a continuation of an indigenous trade hub on the Mississippi River known for thousands of years as Bulbancha. Native peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and the resilient voices of Native Americans remain an inseparable part of our local culture. With gratitude and honor, we acknowledge the indigenous nations that have lived and continued to thrive here. Uh, the Yates Lecture is the Murphy Institute's major public academic event designed to promote university-wide discussion of issues of current concern. The annual Yates Lecture brings leading thinkers and public figures to the Tulane campus to share their insights on a wide range of topics from politics and economics to culture and the arts. The Yates Lecture was endowed in 1996 by Murphy Institute alumna Rebecca Yates Mulander, class of 1989, in memory of her mother, Mary C. Parker Yates. Rebecca Yates Wielander was an outstanding student at Tulane, uh, majoring in political economy as a member of the Murphy Institute's undergraduate program. After graduating from Tulane, she went on to earn a law degree from Harvard Law School and it has had successful careers in both law and business. Uh, Rebecca Yates Wielander's generous donation to establish the Yates Lecture reflects her deep commitment to Tulane University and the Murphy Institute. She is a passionate advocate for education and public engagement and an outstanding representative of the students in our program, many of whom are here today. And so I'm happy to see that. Uh, the Yates Lecture is a fitting tribute to her mother's legacy and her own commitment to excellence. Now to introduce this year's speaker, please let me introduce Dr. Gary Hoover, Executive Director of the Murphy Institute. Dr. Hoover. Hey everybody, um, before I get going, there are seats, but you'll have to sit up front. There's a few here. I know everybody, you know, when you come in late, you especially don't want to sit up front because then everybody sees you sitting up. So I'm going to act like I'm not looking and allow you to find a seat anywhere. Come on, everybody, get, make yourself comfortable and come on in if you want. Yep, there's one there. There's a couple still up front here for folks who are coming in. Just want everyone to be comfortable. And um, there's still two right here. I got two down front, two, I got two. I got two down front. Yeah, come on everybody, let's, let's enjoy. All right, so since everybody's here, let me see, okay. So this is Murphy Place. I am going to be your host, uh, Executive Director Gary Hoover. Up next on the program, <laughs> Kai Rizdahl will speak to us. But first, the numbers. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about what the Murphy Institute has. The Murphy Institute, if you like this type of public engagement, in this type of programming. You should know that the Murphy Institute has three centers. We have a Center for Law and the Economy, we have a Center for Public Policy Research, and we have a Center for Ethics. All three of those centers run programs just like what you're here for today. In addition, we sponsor seminar series for the Department of Economics, 
the School of Law, the Political Science Department, and the Philosophy Department. So there is a lot of very, very good programming going on around the Murphy Sphere. So what I would encourage you to do is, if you haven't already, on your way out, um, there are pamphlets on the table, and they have QR codes. Just punch the QR code, and you'll see something about all of the great programming um, that the Murphy Institute puts on. All right, so let's talk a little bit about our, our guest today. Um, Kai Rizdahl has been the host and senior editor of Marketplace, the most popular program on business and the economy, radio or television, commercial or public broadcasting in the country. He also co-hosts the daily news podcast, Make Me Smart. Kai won an Emmy Award in 2012 for outstanding investigative journalism on a PBS Frontline documentary about money and politics entitled Big Sky, Big Money. And it goes on to say that Kai um, graduated from Emory University. We've decided not to hold that against him. He did say, however, that he applied for Tulane, but wasn't accepted. <laughs> uh, mistake on our part. <clears throat> um, more interesting is this, um, and, and I don't know where we got this factoid from. He also enjoys running, a fact featured in a Runner's World magazine oh article. In his, next in his next life, Kai plans to be a helicopter pilot. That's true. Um, where we get this stuff from is just what we do at Murphy. We find the obscure facts. So without much more ado, let me welcome Kai Rizdahl. Thank you. I, I will never, ever, ever, ever uh, get used to having my biography read out loud. Introductions are the most excruciating thing. Um, it is actually true that I applied to Tulane, uh, and I did not get in, and I obviously could not get in today. Same thing for Emory, by the way, for those of you who are uh, in the know. I know we've got some parents here of, of freshmen for family weekend, so congratulations on getting in. Um, so, uh, so look, I'm going to talk not too terribly long today, maybe 20 minutes. Um, not necessarily about what you hear on the radio, but we can talk about what you hear on the radio later. Uh, but I took to heart the public policy part of the Murphy Institute's mission uh, because I've got, a, I've got a string of things I want to tell you and I want to say to you, and, and then I want to talk about it later. Um, as you've said, uh, I am a journalist a guy who has a radio show on business and the economy who's been doing it for a very long time. But that is not the most important thing about me. The most important thing about me is that I'm a veteran. Two weeks after I graduated from Emory University, July 4th weekend, 1985, I threw everything I owned in the trunk of my car, a 1972 Cutlass 442 convertible, by the way, white with a red top, Worst, worst decision I ever made was selling that car, although it got like a mile to the gallon. Um, uh, and I went down to Pensacola for uh, boot camp and then um, eventually flight school. And I served in the Navy for eight years. Uh, I deployed on the USS Theodore Roosevelt flying E2C Hawkeyes in the Mediterranean and North Atlantic against what was then the Soviet Union. I did uh, a year and a half at the end of my tour on the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. And then I decided I wanted to do something else with my life. I wanted to keep going overseas on the government's dime, but I wanted to do it without 6,000 of my closest, what was then male friends at the time, because there were no women in carrier aviation at that point. So I took the Foreign Service exam, uh, and on a Friday afternoon in 1993, I separated from the Navy, and on the following Monday, I joined the Foreign Service. I spent four years in the Foreign Service, embassies in Ottawa, Canada, lovely town, not very foreign, uh, and Beijing, China. And then through a very long series of events that we can talk about later, it's a, it's a long and convoluted story, I found my way to business and economic journalism. But even all these years later, which is 30 years this spring since I got out of the Navy, My public service, military and civilian, defines me. 
right? It informs how I live my life, how I think about this country, and how I think the challenges about what we face. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today for a little bit. And I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna set it up, if I can make my phone work, uh, with a little story. So the other day, a couple of weeks ago actually, I was at the Hollywood Bowl with my second son. He's 22, just started work this week, about to move out of the house. And as happens when your kids get older and they're about to move out of the house, you spend all the time that you can with them because they're going and it's different. Um, but that's a whole nother podcast. Um, so of course I said I would go with them. He had a spare ticket to see the Lumineers. Um, and if you've never been to the Hollywood Bowl, let me just say I recommend it. It's the most Southern California thing you can ever do, right? People down front in the box seats get catered meals. People in the cheap seats up top bring bread and cheese and wine. You have the sunset over the hills. It's amazing, and you should try it. Um, if you've never heard the Lumineers, they're a good band. They put on a fun show. Uh, they have a really distinctive sound, and the distinctive sound is mostly due to the guy who's the lead singer, a guy by the name of Wesley Schultz. And so we're at the bowl that night, and there are 18,000 people in the bowl. I mean, it's close to sold out. Everybody's on their feet. We've been standing for two hours. And Wesley Schultz goes to the microphone, and he sets up this song. And I hope this works. Okay. Okay. Well, I, had a, I had an uncle I never got to meet. His name was Charles. They called him Charlie. And when, uh, when Charlie, he was my dad's oldest brother. And when uh, Charlie was in high school, he had really big plans. He was gonna go on maybe to be a doctor. He had all these grand, grand plans and a really smart guy. And he heard JFK, he heard his president. He gave this beautiful speech. And he was so moved by the words of this leader that he changed his whole future. He put it on hold and he said, uh, I'm gonna serve my country. I'm gonna volunteer to go to war. And I, never got to, I never got to meet my uncle because of that choice, you know, because of that choice. But I admire him for that. And when I think of my Uncle Charlie, I think of this idea that it's the words of our leaders, they really do matter. They matter to my Uncle Charlie back then. They matter to us right now. So this one's for my Uncle Charlie, this is about him. This is called Charlie Boy. So Charlie Boy is a really good song. And I'm not gonna play it, because you guys all have Spotify and you can play it for yourself. <laughs> but, it's, but it's a really good song. And the first line is Charlie Boy, first born in 44, don't go off to war. So I'm a military history guy, right? It's, you know, that's just kind of the way I'm geared. Um, Business and economic journalism is really something I only do on the side. Uh, and Vietnam in particular resonates with me for reasons that I can't really articulate except I think maybe it has something to do with being in survival and resistance school right after I got my wings where they lock you in a mock POW camp for four days and you get beat up by CIA, actual CIA interrogators posing as Russian soldiers, all of which came out of the experience the POWs in Vietnam had. That's why Sears School exists. Anyway, Northern Maine, 1996, I do not recommend. Um, but, but I don't know if you picked up on it. If you were watching me, you saw me point to the speakers. That bit where the crowd applauded at Charlie's choice to serve his country. I know why they were applauding, right? There's real gratitude, I get that. And it is popular to support the troops. Politicians make it so. But how many of the 18,000 people in the bowl that night do you suppose? That was Colorado, by the way. That was not, I did not bootleg that um, for those on video. Um, how many of the 18,000 people in the bowl that night do you suppose actually were veterans? According to the government, 6.5% of the American population are veterans. So 1,200 people out of that 18,000 maybe double that percentage actually know a veteran. So maybe 3,000 people out of that 18,000 in the bowl that night really have 
familiarity with national service, right? So what's my point? I've been trying to figure out for a long time um, why this country is the way it is. Why half of us can't agree with the other half? Why compromise has become a dirty word? If you've been listening to the news out of Washington, that's where we are today. Why fundamentally the United States doesn't really seem all that united anymore. And after a couple of years of thinking about this and reporting on it in my spare time and doing the research and making the calls, here's where I am. I don't believe that we have in this country a common identity. We don't have common experiences. We don't have shared burdens. We don't have common understandings. And I think that has helped our political divide get wider and wider. It's been exacerbated in the last eight or 10 years, of course, we all know that. And I think that divide is now at a really dangerous point. And for a long time, given my background, right, I came from it at a there's a, there's a disconnect between the civilian and military sides of this society. And there is, right? 6% of Americans are veterans, 94% are not. And if you think about what the American military has been doing for the last 25 years, or 50 years, that's a lot, right? That's a lot of people who don't have familiarity with some of the sacrifices that are being made. But, but that's not it. I mean, the civilian military divide is real. But I think the missing piece here isn't military service, right? It's about public service. It's about building and rebuilding a social fabric in this country in whatever small way we can. I don't think we actually know each other at all. So here's my proposal. A year of national service, compulsory, maybe two, if Congress can get its act together, which is a whole different thing. <laughs> the Pentagon, by the way, neither wants nor would know what to do with a conscripted force, right? National service, civilian service is what I'm talking about. The Defense Department tried that in Vietnam, didn't work out so well. See also Uncle Charlie, right? Milton Friedman, an economist you might have heard of, pointed out how economically inefficient the draft was. So that's not what I'm talking about. Civilian compulsory national service. There are today a zillion ways to serve, right? AmeriCorps, Teach for America, City Year, Job Corps, Peace Corps, I could go on. The challenge is not the opportunity to serve in this country, and it's not actually a lack of desire, right? Since 1993, AmeriCorps has had a million participants. They put in a billion and a half hours of public service, right? Disaster preparedness and recovery, as I think probably a lot of this people, city in this, people in this city, rather, are, are acquainted with. They do environmental stewardship. They do public health. They also do, by the way, veteran and family services at AmeriCorps. There are more applicants now for AmeriCorps than we have room for. There are 15 applicants for every job. There's more applicants that we have funding for as well. So the challenge, really, in building up national service as a thing that we do in this country is twofold. One is a national service infrastructure, right? Something similar to but different than the selective service system that every male 18 to 26 in this country should be familiar with. Right? That's one challenge. It will take time and money to set it up. It will take congressional will to set it up. Again, not something we can count on. I grant you all that. The real barrier, I th barrier though, I think, is this. The idea that living in this country comes with obligations, with costs, right, with sacrifices. That idea has been forgotten long ago a very long time ago. We are used to getting life, we are used to getting the benefits of life in this society, in this economy, for nothing, right? Without doing the work. And changing that mindset, I think, is gonna take work. So, so why does this matter and where am I going? I believe national service, voluntary military service or a compulsory, compulsory civilian option, will bring change to this economy for the better and to the country. It will help bridge, but not eliminate, right? It will not erase, but it will help bridge some of the challenges we have in this country around race and class, right? Around income and geography, around language as well. Did you know Switzerland has four recognized national languages? You did, wow, okay. That's good for you. Um, 
One of the ways that they work to lower that as a barrier to establishing a Swiss national identity is two years of compulsory national service, either military or civilian, by the way. So how do we come to a better consensus of what it takes to make this society function again, right? What enthusiasm can we have for this country when only a small fraction of people are actually doing the work? We've got, to borrow from my economic colleagues, a classic free rider problem, right? So many people who take for granted the economic opportunities, right, the benefits of the rule of law and civil engagement, the other common goods, right, that we have as this society, we take them all for granted. And I believe if we can convince enough people to work together in whatever field suits them, right? Again, we have to set up the infrastructure. Americans from all backgrounds can build trust and mutual understanding. And if we can get critical mass on that, then I think that's half the battle. So just because I'm a business and economics reporter, although grudgingly, as you've seen in my background, and this lecture series is in some degree about political economy and public policy, Let's talk about the economics of this thing for a minute. There are going to be people who will say, well, wait, let's do the cost benefit of this, right? Let's really cost it out and see what we're going to get. They're going to say, wait, how do we know that we're going to get what we're paying for if we set up a national program of compulsory service? A and the answer is, we're not. We're just not. And my response would be, how do you put a price tag on civic engagement? How do you put a dollar value? on a sense of national identity or social cohesion. The Biden administration's budget, by the way, for national service programs this year, two billion dollars. Two billion dollars. That is, and I'm being kind here, nothing, right? And we should be clear, by the way, participating in national service programs, and this is according to surveys done by AmeriCorps and by Job Corps, they have higher educational achievement than their peers do, Women participants are more likely to get degrees than men in every field and every degree except for the PhD, which we should work on. National service correlates with better health, more useful practical skills, and oh, by the way, and thank you, better civic engagement. Those who participate in it are more civically engaged. We know that. Sure, for the government and for the individual, there are some costs, but again, I don't believe you can put a price on what's at stake. So, we can talk about the actual economy in a minute if you want to, with me and who. We'll take some questions. Um, but I'm going to say something here that, that maybe you'll agree with, maybe you won't, and we can talk about that too. I believe that the only way this economy works, literally the only way, is if there's trust, right? Is if there's trust in each other, if there's trust in companies, trust that bills are going to be paid and goods and services are going to be delivered on time and on schedule, that institutions are fair and the rules apply to everyone. That, however, as we know, is not where this country is right now. There is no trust. Tens of millions of people believe Joe Biden didn't win the election. Thousands of people turned to violence on January 6th. The former president, as you all know, is under indictment right now for his actions on that day. So here's the question that I want you all to think about, and it's been on my mind since January 6th. Can American capitalism, the American market economy, survive the near death of American democracy? I've been doing this a long time, right? Thinking about reporting on working in the American economy and American capitalism. A and the assumption has been that the economy just works, right? It just works. Not for everybody, obviously, and not all the time, and I'll talk about that in a second. But it's been clear, like since Hamilton and his report on manufacturers, that the institutions of this economy work because the institutions of this democracy work. So here's the, the actual question. How much does it matter for American capitalism, the American market economy, if the American democracy, capital D, right, is in some peril? America is and has been, so far, a nation of laws, right? Consistent regulations, fair applications of the rules, equal opportunity to make a buck. It is literally the foundation of the American dream, right? It's why people want to come here. It's why companies want to come here. It has been a competitive advantage for us for centuries. So I think American capitalism actually needs American democracy. And I should be completely clear here, right? The American brand of capitalism 
and the economy that has grown from it is in a lot of ways completely terrible. Completely terrible, right? There's too much poverty and inequality. There's too much injustice and racism and lying and cheating and stealing in how this country goes about its economic life. Big businesses have too much power. The poor and underrepresented are willfully left poor and underrepresented. The environment is too often and until too recently an afterthought. We spend a three quarters of a trillion dollars a year, a year on national defense. And remember, I'm a veteran, right? But we can't manage to agree on low double digit billions of dollars worth of, insert your favorite social welfare program right here in your social safety net program, right? We, we can't get there. But here's the thing, the same brand of capitalism that brings us those bads because they are bads, brings us the goods too. The things that make people want to come here to find a better chance. That let inventors and innovators build and grow their dreams in this country. They make us literally the economic envy of the world. And that doesn't just happen out of nowhere, right? And this gets back to the top. There's a baseline set of conditions that foster the investment, the trust, and the confidence in the American economy. The rule of law, Regulations, processes clearly set forth, an expectation of fairness and recourse when you're wronged. And I think right now, we've got a democracy in peril with an economy that, while it is strong, right? Listen to Marketplace, you'll know that. The economy is strong, but it's not what people are feeling. And we say this all the time in the newsroom, right? You can do headline economic numbers until the cows come home, but if people aren't feeling it in their everyday, it just doesn't matter, and people aren't feeling it. And I think the lack of a common understanding, right, that lack of shared experiences and mutual concern that I talked about, the idea that we just don't know each other, I think that blinds us to the great potential of this country, right? Its resilience, its optimism, its capacity for good and meaning, even if we don't deliver all the time. And look, maybe I'm full of it, right? It's entirely possible. Maybe what this country needs is way more than just young people doing a year or two of national service. It's entirely possible. But I think right now, with so very much at stake, I think it's worth your consideration. And I think the question I asked about whether the American economy can survive the demise of American democracy is something you ought to think about. That's what I got. <laughs>